You're listening to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast. This week's episode is made possible by ATA. Visit atacpa.net to learn more about the services they offer for individuals and organizations. ATA, your long-term accounting partner. Today's episode features Robert Nunley, Randy Cooper, and Henrietta Giles of the Weekly County Reconciliation Project. And this is Scott Williams, your host for Real Foot Forward, where every single week we talk about the history, the people, and the culture of our home right here in West Tennessee. I have a really special episode today. Rather than just one guest, we're going to talk to three very interesting guests who are working together um, on the Weekly County Reconciliation Project. So we're going to find out all about that. But first, we're going to meet each one of them. Uh, Robert Nunley has spent 30 years in youth development in community centers. Uh, Randy Cooper is the pastor at First United Methodist Church and Henry Giles, um, Henrietta, but we're, we're buds. So I call her Henry. Um, she is an instructor at UT Martin in communications, which is a department that's near and dear to my own heart. So we're going to talk to her as well, but we're going to start off with Robert. Um, you can't see, but Robert's got an incredible wall full of, um, fantastic art and, um, very cool antiques back there. I see, uh, welcome to the podcast, Robert. Thank you. Good to be with you. So tell me a little bit about you and and um, how you ended up in Weekly County and and what you've been doing. I know that you've recently um, are uh, retired. So tell us a little bit about what's going on in your life. Well, thanks again, Scott, for the uh, the invitation. Um, what I didn't mention before we went on to the uh, production part of this uh, program is that I'm a native son. I was uh, I was born right up the road in a place called Fulton, Kentucky, and that's probably about a 15 minute drive. Uh, north of the border, and uh, that was in 1953. So I'm a baby boomer and returned to this part of Northwest Tennessee when my parents relocated here uh, from central Indiana, and I came back like a lot of baby boomers who were responsible for being a caregiver for their parents. That's what brought me back to this region, and I never left, and that was 12 years ago. Uh, I uh, have done this work with children and youth, uh, initially in Indianapolis in the inner city, and then back here at the uh, kind of a a local rural community, which was kind of different and special for me. But my link to um, this area goes back to when I was a child. And of course, during that time, I attended, historically speaking, contextually, I attended what's called the Weekly County Training School, which was a Jim Crow school. So colored children only, and the races did not do a lot of things together. And one of those things was that they didn't do was, of course, they didn't attend the same school. So that's probably my interest in this whole campaign with uh, WCRP. And that's a little bit about me. Fantastic. Randy, how about you? Well, I was born the same year that Robert was born, 1953. Uh, I'm not native to Weekly County. My home place is 42 miles south of here over in Gibson County on a farm. I've been a minister now for 42 years, a United Methodist pastor. Uh, And when I was brought here by my bishop, sent here by my bishop uh, over 11 years ago, I came to a county that I'd never lived in. But my ministry has been, except for a few years, throughout West Tennessee and West Kentucky. And I feel like I do drink the same water and breathe the same air as Weekly County people even though that's not the county of my birth. How about you, Henry? I am a native Tennessean. I grew up in, um, I keep wanting to say West Tennessee because I moved here from Nashville. So, you know, from middle Tennessee to West Tennessee, but I grew up in Haywood County um, in Stanton, which is near Brownsville, um, about halfway between Memphis and Jackson. Um, So that's my home town. I've lived in Nash. I lived in Nashville for several years. I lived in Charlotte um, for some time as well. And I am a UTM alumna. So um, it wasn't as much of a culture shock to come back to Martin um, as some might think. But um, it's it it's a road that I really hadn't planned on. One of my former instructors, former professors asked me if I would consider teaching. 
And I come from a family of educators, but I hadn't ever taught before. I, you know, working um, professionally as, um, you know, on, on the creative end. And I did give it some thought and made the decision to, to come here. And the, the way that I got involved with WCRP is my sisters and I took a trip to Montgomery um, two years ago, just when the Equal Justice Initiative opened the museum and the, the, the lynching memorial. And we, of course, were very moved by that. And so when I came back, I started talking to some people on the Civil Rights um, Conference Committee, on which I also served. And I was telling them about this and how, um, you know, there's a monument there for people who had been lynched in Weekly County and that we could, we could claim that. And so in talking about that, um, with that particular group, I also found out that um, there was this other group of people who were interested in the same thing. They also had taken the trip. And I'm sure Robert will, will give more insight in, into that in a little bit. But that's how the, these two, um, two groups sort of came together for me. In fact, I don't think it, it, we weren't even an official group then um, when I first started. So um, it's all very new but very important work. And I'm just happy to be working alongside Robert and Randy and so many of the others in our group. Fantastic. You threw out the acronym WCRP. So I'm going to ask uh, Randy to uh, let everybody know what exactly that means, because it's not WKRP in Cincinnati. WCRP, acronym for Weekly County Reconciliation Project. There was a point sometime after a trip to Montgomery when those original people who made that trip determined that it was time to share and open some of these concerns to the larger community. Uh, after a few, though it may have been more than one or two, it may have been two or three meetings, some determination was made or there was a sense that we needed to have a name for ourselves, however fledgling the group might be. And the word reconciliation was an important part. Uh, nearly everyone within the group, while the group does not claim an official, um, make official claim about of being a religious group, a Christian group, nearly everyone within the group is, is uh, are people of faith. And the word reconciliation was uh, a very important word for us as part of the work that we do. Uh, and so that word became a part of our name, and it continues to be, I think, an important word in the central task that we see ourselves uh, as we think about reconciliation as a local group of people in a particular community who seek to bear witness for this purpose. What, uh, what was the genesis of the trip uh, initially? Was it just a group of friends getting together to go or or how did that come about uh, we learned about brian stevenson and his book just mercy at about the same time that we learned of the opening of the um, museum in montgomery and the lynching memorial by the equal justice initiative there was some hope that two groups from within two congregations in martin uh, could come together and make the trip um, that didn't exactly work out as we hoped, but there ended up being nine of us to make that trip in July of 2018. Uh, as Henry says, a very moving trip, one that led to processing and to thinking about. It led to more meetings over Friday night dinners uh, with those nine and a few others that finally led us to think we don't need to keep this to ourselves. We don't know what direction it'll take with others but it's time to share that with others. So by Christmas or so of 2018, uh, there was this uh, discernment that we needed to be thinking about the larger community. Robert, how did you uh, hear about or get involved with the group? Well, uh, Randy invited me. 
Um, I, I didn't know that the group existed. Uh, it, it turns out, I think maybe if I'm not mistaken, I was sort of a, uh, uh, a last minute insert because, uh, you know, some folks that were invited had things come up and I'm grateful. I don't, I don't say that in any way to disparagingly, uh, speak to the invitation. I'm grateful that that person, I'm not happy that the person couldn't make it, but uh, it was my game. And so that's how I got involved. Uh, Randy uh, contacted me, or maybe it was Gail, his wife, that called me and said, look, we're thinking about this trip. We're, we're planning it. It's uh, scheduled. Uh, would you like to go? And of course, <clears throat> I was, I'm familiar with Brian Stevenson, was not familiar with his work in Montgomery to the scale that it, it, it exists and his footprint in Montgomery. And so that was compelling enough for me to say, sure, I'd, I'd like to come. And then uh, last but not least, um, <clears throat> the, in my sense is that in this small Northwest rural community that uh, whites and blacks do socialize uh, so I'm not saying that, but to the degree that there's a certain measure of um, of deliberate and intention intentionality to be together, and especially on the topic of race, because that's a that's a topic that even now, all the more with all the tension that's in the atmosphere, you just don't see many folks that are promoting that kind of dialogue when you have, you know, races, uh, blacks and whites coming together, or people of color. And so uh, that was compelling and, and, and of interest to me because I wanted to be in the thick of that discussion and in the thick of, of sharing and, and getting to know my neighbor better. And um, for timeline purposes, about when did, did uh, this all start? When, was, when did the visit take place and when did you all start working on this project? The trip was July 2018. Conversations continued occasionally in the fall. The winter of 2019 is whenever the larger community heard and a good number responded in wonderful ways. So little did you know you were uh, really laying the groundwork for a time that was right around the corner. Um, Henry, can you, uh, for anyone who hasn't had the benefit of being to the museum or seeing it, can you tell us a little bit uh, more about it? First, it's it's very moving and you need to prepare yourself mentally for, for what you will see because it does provide a journey through history, um, primarily looking at the, the era that's referred to as the, you know, the, the lynching era around, um, you know, reconstruction and um, then leading in, into Jim Crow. Um, it's a very painful journey where in this museum, not only do you learn about the victims, one of the displays that they have uh, really connects you to the people and um, it connects you to the place where, they, um, where their lives were taken. Uh, there's a wall of jars and in those jars are soiled from places where different individuals were lynched. Um, and for instance, there is, is one, I grew up in, in Haywood County and Elbert Williams was lynched in 1940 in Haywood County. And so up on the wall, there's a jar with his name on it and the soil from the Hatchie River where his body was, um, was found. And so it's very poignant, it's very moving. Um, there are, you know, interactive, exhibits there. And not only did Brian Stevenson do a superb job with telling the story of lynching, but he draws the connection to current day incarceration. As you well know, the incarceration rates for people of color um, are exorbitant. And so he, he brings those two events together and, and, and show the similarities. And um, then, of course, down the street a bit is what's commonly referred to as the lynching memorial, where there are steel beams. And on those steel beams are the names that are um, inscribed of people who have been lynched. And the way 
uh, the memorial is laid out, once you enter the um, the steel bars, not bars, the um, the memorials, the steel memorials are eye level. And then the further along you go, the higher they become to give you the sense of a body that's hanging from a tree, which is how so many um, black people were killed. And um, the way, the, the other way that it's set up is it's set up by state and then by county. So if you go into the section that's Tennessee, you can walk through and see um, those steel memorials that represent each county. And as I said before, there is one for Weekly County. There's one for Obion County. And I had done some research beforehand and learned about the high number of Blacks who were lynched in neighboring Obion County, which is where you are, Scott. Right. Just, Lake I think, and Haywood, a lot of the counties all around us. A lot of know, the counties, have yeah. Been. And uh, so I was fascinated by that. And, uh, you know, we walked through and saw, you know, Madison and, you know, all of the counties in Tennessee. And then, of course, you would see some from other states. And one that sticks out to me was a county in Texas. And I think there were about 20 names. But what stood out was it, um, it said unknown and then a date, unknown, a date. Um, and so they were all killed on the same day, but no one knows their name. And so that was one of the things I think that moved all of us, that, that moved WCRP to thinking, this is such a scar on American history. And so much of it happened right here. Why don't we start the conversation to at least talk about it and not to ascribe blame or make someone feel embarrassed because true, no one, you know, within our group participated, but, you know, certainly you can make the argument that, that some have benefited from those systems. We want it to come there to at least make it possible for people to start having a conversation. Because as we well know, it's really hard. That's one of those subjects that, that, we, that we tend to avoid, you know, religion, politics, and, and, and all of that race. But we decided to take the bold step and at least create a forum where people could start having those conversations. And I think we have been pleasantly surprised. We have organized a few community events and they have all turned out so wonderfully. Um, the participation has been great. The stories have been great. People have attended who probably didn't have the intention of speaking or sharing, but they ended up speaking and sharing and told compelling stories about how they grew up and how their opinions about race were formed and how as they got older, it sort of became a struggle. Like, why did I grow up? Why was I taught to think this way? Um, and so, you know, also as, as an instructor, I see it in my classes. Um, of course, you know, I teach at UT Martin, a predominantly white institution. And so a lot of my students have never had, I've had them tell me, I've had some of my students tell me that they have never had a black instructor ever, not in grade school, high school, I'm the first. And so for a lot of them, they don't quite know how to handle that. And I can see that, I can sense that. And I've had some who, who have told me, you know, you're the first black instructor I've ever had. I've never even really had a conversation with a black person before. And um, so here we are in the 21st century and we have young people, we have ch um, children, we're, we're raising children who have not had that exposure to people who don't look like them. So the conversation, you know, 
it's right. And we are just wanting to provide a platform. So Randy, when you first began uh, working on this project, uh, were you a little nervous of the uh, response of some people in the community or did you dive in fearless? Talk to me a little bit about that. Nervous, no. On the other hand, fearless. I just thought it was a good thing to go to Montgomery and uh, see if we could get some people together and talk about it. I don't know that I am aware of, it, of that much. I guess there, we had a, a candlelight soon, what, a few weeks after the death of George Floyd. Is that, that's when it was, wasn't it, here in town. Uh, I was aware that there could be some issues there. But I guess I feel so much uh, the support of others in the group, as well as the blessing of others in my church, uh, though it's a church with different thoughts about this matter, but still I feel that and I uh, feel like it's also the right thing to do. So honestly, I don't know that I think that much about fear or courage. I just think, well, this is what we need to do. It was interesting for the candlelight vigil. You also um, were able to take advantage of social media and have it um, on Facebook. So I remember seeing, you know, I watched it uh, when y'all were gathered there. So it was really a good use of uh, social media. Um, Robert, I know you've been involved in the group. Um, is there uh, anything that you've seen both uh, personally um, or professionally that surprised you or that gave you hope or uh, disappointed you uh, as somebody who's involved what are, what are your thoughts on the project probably a little bit of all those experiences that you just mentioned I mean how can you have a collection of human beings and not have you know run the gamut in terms of what you're experiencing what you're running up against but one of the things that I've really sort of kept the focus on uh, Scott more than anything has been the examination of myself, you know, areas where I've needed to sort of take a look at me, my biases, uh, my stereotypes, uh, et cetera, because it's, it's, it's just, it's, a, it's almost a slam dunk, if I can use that descriptive, to look at the injustices of whites against blacks and to the systemic racism. I mean, you know, I went to a Jim Crow school uh, I was living in a town that was separated. You didn't go in the front door. So I've had that experience. And so I've heard the narratives. I've heard the stories from my grandparents and uncles about what they went through. And of course, I was a, I'm a child of the civil rights era. I was, I was a teenager when Dr. King was assassinated. And, and so, and then all the other assassinations that, that went black and white during that era. So I'm steeped in that experience and yet I realize that it's been so toxic that it's, it's kind of like uh, the virus. You know, you, you need to put a mask on, you need to protect yourself. In this case, uh, I've, I've really, really been focused on me and, and to the extent that I can sort of, if I can use the term detox from that kind of hatred, that kind of uh, cancer, that kind of, flu. Uh, and so to that end, I've been really preoccupied with the examination of my own heart in this matter called reconciliation, because if I don't do that, then I realize that I've been affected in a very, uh, in a very profound way. And there are certain emotions that get stirred up. You know, the Floyd incident stirred up some stuff again. And so to that end, my engagement and involvement in WCRP is, is in some ways a, a, a means of, uh, of healing uh, for me, myself and then a way forward in having an honest and a sincere and a humble conversation with my neighbor that doesn't look like me necessarily. So uh, that, that's my own kind of uh, sensibility about WCRP and how it uh, – how it, the significance of it to me personally. And so it, it meets a number of needs in that, re, in that response or that regard. Uh, um, Robert, is it uh, open to anybody from anywhere or do you have to be from Weekly County to be a part of WCRP? Uh, as far as I know, uh, Henry and, and Randy can correct me, but it's open to anyone, whosoever will, 
that wants to come and and listen or share this, their own experience. So that's the beauty of it all. We're not, uh, I guess, uh, centered or focused on uh, on Weekly County exclusively because this is a matter that affects the state and the nation. And so we're, we're, I'd just like to add one other thing. I'm, I'm really pleased to be a participant in WCRP. Um, it, it's not what I expected when I came back to the South. In fact, I had some pretty strong feelings about the South growing up as a teenager. Uh, and I won't go into that right now, but let's just say that I, I didn't ever imagine prior to this experience that I, this would ever be, I would ever be a part of this in the South, in the reconstructed South, the Jim Crow South, that people weren't ready for this and nor was I ready for it in some way. So it, it took a little something, but it's open. It's open to whosoever will, Scott. Um, Henry, what, what's, is there, is there a long-term goal or is, is there a short-term goal? What's the objective of WCRP? We actually have, have several objectives. One is, you know, creating a space for people to start having the conversations because the conversations are on, ongoing. You know, we do, we are focusing on commemorating the lives of people who were lynched from Weekly County. That's one of our, one of our objectives. And, you know, it, it goes on, you know, we, I, I mentioned the the era of lynching before referring to, you know, during reconstruction and, and Jim Crow, but, you know, we are witnessing it now. It's just in a different form um, where there are cameras now that are, that are showing these different incidents. And, you know, so they, they can also be referred to as, as lynchings. So having a space for, for those conversations, acquiring the um the memorials that are featured at the um at the lynching memorial in montgomery um they were i mean it's it's an extraordinary idea when they um were working on this museum or um the memorial they had the brilliant idea of making replicas of all of the the steel memorials that are featured there. And so while you can go and visit and see the one for Weekly County, there's a replica that Weekly County can claim and um, display in some solemn way and respectable way in Weekly County. So that's one of one of our goals is to do the work and and you do have to do the work you just can't say oh I'd, I'd like to get it and bring it to to weekly county you have to show um the equal justice initiative that you are serious that you have put in the work the community work and so we're in the process of doing that and so we want to bring the weekly county memorial to weekly county where we don't know that yet but um it would be here so people could see it where they could remember because i think that's one of the the um worst things that could happen that we don't remember what happened and so this is a way to to honor those lives we actually had the opportunity just this past you know a few days ago to honor the life of mally wilson who was a Weekly County resident in 1915, who was killed in Greenfield. And so we were able to gather as a group. We went to Greenfield and we walked along the railroad track. We were able to, one of our, our members, Carol Cavalier, who I keep telling her I'm going to get her a trench coat and a magnifying glass because she is truly a detective, she has done some remarkable research and um, she was able to get an idea of where Mally Wilson was lynched in Greenfield and which happened to be along the railroad tracks. And so WCRP with our little contingency on Friday, we went down the, the railroad tracks and found the approximate spot where this um, tragedy occurred. Um, 
And in, in fact, it occurred on September 4th, 1915. And the day that we went there was September 4th. Wow. So it was very meaningful for, for us to do that. We collected the soil. You know, I mentioned before how um, the museum has the soil displayed in jars. So we were able to collect the soil. It was important for us to, to do it on that anniversary. And so at some point, we will send the jar to Montgomery. It will be displayed and then we will keep a jar as well. So um, we are a very determined group. Um, and we have a whole lot of good people who are a part of, of this group who are really committed to finding information, to engaging the community. And so um, I was so inspired and, and, and so um, proud to take part in that event last week because, you know, unfortunately, Mally Wilson, that's a name that even people in Greenfield now have never heard of. They've never heard this story. And so we don't want people to forget. And so it's a way to honor, honor them and to give them humanity. And, you know, as people say now, to say their name. So. Yeah, I think you mentioned uh, a great example a while ago with Elbert Williams and Haywood County and the marker they've put up and, and the attention they brought to his case um, is a good example of bringing attention. So, Robert, uh, tell me a little bit about the trips to the lynching museum and this project. Why? Why is this important for us in 2020, all these years later, uh, to be thinking about these things? Well, you know, it's a two-part question for answer for me. Uh, certainly a child of the Jim Crow South and the experience of, of, of uh, racial uh, disparity and separation, I had my own personal issues as I grew up. When I was a child, I didn't know anything but that. That was, all, that was normal. But as I got older and saw and understood more, it, it, it breeded within me a certain resentment, a certain bitterness. And so this was a, a personal way of coming to grips with that thing that I realized I needed to reckon with that personally as a black man. I needed to reckon with that because otherwise bitterness and resentment would eat me alive. You know, and I didn't want to be that kind of a person. So for me personally, that's what it was. Uh, and you set apart the person who may ask the question, well, why are you guys doing this? Uh, you're going to stir up trouble. Or, you know, uh, some, some individuals say, we're getting along fine. What's the problem? You know, let's just le let, let dead dogs lie, so to speak. So that's the first part of the answer to the question, Scott. The second part is that part of that process for me was to have a meaningful engagement with uh, people that I had previously sort of viewed as kind of one size fits all. That all, if you're white, you must be a racist because you look like the same people that turned the fire hoses on, that did the lynchings, that, uh, that, that perpetrated the violence and the terrorism. And so uh, to have a group that's saying, whites, that's saying, look, I wanna have that difficult conversation. And particularly in our community, because this is where I live. This is where I live. I'm not interested in what, in a way, I'm not interested in what's going on in Nashville or at D, in D.C., although there's a, there's a crossing of those two divides. But I wanted to be a force and influence upon the local community that I live in because I believe it starts with individuals. And therefore, rather than be a finger pointer, I thought, what hinders me? Why can't I participate in this and get the benefits on both ends? First of all, a healing for me and also a healing and a, uh, a better community for, for the folks in, in Weekly County or more specifically where I am in Martin. Well, and I mean, it is easy, it, not easy, but, you know, somebody who's white who thinks, I'm not racist, you know, when you start having to think about these things, you have to question yourself, you know, what kind of, you know, attitudes or behaviors have I had? What kind of privilege have I had? You know, it does start to open up, 
you know, a lot of uh, thinking that that sometimes is threatening or scary. And so I think maybe that's what, when you guys start talking about this stuff at the Weekly County uh, Reconciliation Project, I think in, for some people, that's what it starts to bring up to the surface. Um, Randy, how about you? Have you, do you... Um, since any of your, uh, any of, of course, your church never would, but any church people that you encounter, um, is there any pushback at all? Oh, there might be, and there would be. Um, I, I think uh, in terms of the whole question of why, uh, you, you bring it up. I'll mention two aspects of it, much as Robert mentioned too. Number one, the fact that it's been so completely covered over to just uncover it a little bit. I don't know if I was in my 40s or even in my 50s before I became aware that lynchings took place in the county of my birth. And I don't think I need to be 50 years old before I at least knew that. And before that was at least a part of my recognition of the world in which I live. And then I think the second thing to say is for, for those who, um, who who claim the the uh, identity of Christian, it's to recognize that the one we call Lord was himself a victim of a mob. He was a victim of something that was uh, torture, tortuous, uh, that there is a, 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 a strong resemblance between what happened to Jesus and what happens in times past, what has happened to people who were completely innocent. Uh, and I don't think that we should fail to recognize that when we are trying to learn a little bit about our past uh, and name it, that that's a way of also honoring the one who suffered for all innocent victims on the cross. Henry, how about you? I know you've probably seen and heard frequently, all lives matter. So people are wanting to know, you know, look, why focus on this? What, do you, what are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts on the the All Lives Matter rebuttal is if all lives mattered, we wouldn't be having this conversation. (laughs) If all lives mattered, we wouldn't see a man's life snuffed out of him over the period of almost nine minutes watching it. So, of course, as human beings, all lives matter. That's how... You know, we were taught from little children that you're supposed to treat everyone the way you want to be treated. So, of course, all lives matter. But we cannot stick our heads in the sand so deeply where we totally ignore what's happening to certain segments of of our population. Um, I, I heard and I, and I love the analogy that that um, Pastor Randy gave about, um, you know, Jesus is the 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 tragic events that that uh, led to his death and and how it mirrors so many things that that we've seen and that we still see, um, but you know I, I heard someone uh, try to explain this and said if there's a house on fire on your street and the firemen are there and they are putting out that fire, but you as a neighbor say well what about my house? you know, what, you're not paying attention to my house. And so, of course, the answer is, well, you know, your house isn't on fire. This is what needs attention now. Um, and so it's, it's, it's an oversimplified analogy, but I think people can, can start to feel comfortable with, well, all lives matter, because then the challenge is off of you to think about those other lives. So, um, you know, that's what I think about that, that whole concept of, of all lives matter. Of course they do, but there are some that have, um, you know, been without resources, um, been without, um, you know, housing. Um, they have been over incarcerated um, over-arrested, over-policed. So we have to focus our attention on, on those injustices. Um, Randy, if uh, someone is listening and wants to be part of this, uh, what, what should they do? 
We have a Facebook page, <clears throat> Weekly County Reconciliation Project. That may be the best way to try to make contact. Um, we would welcome, um, uh, I have to turn quickly to Robert and to Henry. What is there a second alternative, a second option for someone who doesn't have Facebook? So Robert, as somebody who uh, left the area and has come back and has gotten involved in, in this group, uh, has it been a helpful way to uh, get to know people and get to know the area again? Uh, sure. Sure it has. Um, it's, it's been, um, as I said before, not only a helpful way to get to know people, uh, but also to, uh, to, to establish some genuine and some authentic uh, connections um, beyond just the kind of the, the routine kind of, hello, how are you? What do you do? This is where I go. You go to church. Yes. It's, it's really for me, the, the, the real essence of it for me has, has, has really helped bridge that, that gulf, you know, in terms of historically, and it's still not that, that different nowadays. I mean, people chat and they know each other and their children play on the same baseball team, but they don't really interact that much. You know, it, people are still staying in their own little tribes. And so part of that's the history of this area. And that, that ghost is still alive and well and, and walking the streets. And that's not to suggest that there haven't been progress. I'm not advocating that, but the genuine kinds of engagement where you're talking about some really tough things and you're not blowing up with each other and you're sort of committed to, uh, to peace. You're committed to peace and reconciliation, and that's the overriding uh, consensus. So it's a safe place. So yes, Scott, it's, it's been that, but even more for me than just uh, getting to know people and you know who installs air conditioners and who sells used cars and that kind of thing. <laughs> and who, who works at a museum. <laughs> right, Scott, <laughs> who works at a museum. Yeah. It's well, not, thank you. Thank not, you all. Go ahead. Go ahead, Randy. Only to say it's not a group that's going to live by blame. Uh, we, we seek not to place blame on anyone, but to be those who are, who recognize our common humanity uh, and who, who want to share that with each other. Well, that's um, an excellent spot for us to end the episode, but I'm hoping that we keep the dialogue going. I'm going to come to your next uh, event. I'm going to uh, follow you on Facebook, um, and I'm super excited about the work you all are doing and um, hope that I can, can be a little tiny part of it. And I, too, would love to listen and hear uh, what everybody's saying and uh, do some uh, some looking inside as well. So thank you all so much. I know that you've inspired a lot of uh, listeners um, also today. So thanks for being on the episode. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. Start planning your visit to Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. And also be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.